Good morning, brothers and sisters. The Lord be with you. If you are visiting with us today, welcome to Elfin Wild Church. We are glad that you're with us this morning. I invite you all to find the blue friendship pads that can be found on the center aisle. If you could sign them for us and pass them down the row and back again, that help us stay connected with you. And same for those who are worshiping online, if you could find the virtual friendship pad that help us stay connected with you as well. Every week at 945, we have Kids Sunday School and adult education classes. We have three adult classes being offered right now, so please look in your bulletin to find out what those are, and we will see you there next week. Elizabeth has some announcements. Good morning. I have a couple of announcements. The first has to do with Goat Camp, which is coming up August 7th through 11th from 9 to 11 a.m. Um, in the church building. Um, Sign-ups will close July 23rd, so make sure you sign your child up if you want them to come or if they're interested in coming. There's an insert in the uh, pews that has the QR code that you can scan with the camera on your phone um, to sign them up, or it's on our website. Um, kids can participate in Creative Corner, which is arts and crafts, dance and music, sports, STEM, or cooking, which is new this year. Um, and all week they'll just be learning about what it means to glorify God with those gifts. So please sign up. Spots are limited, um, and we would love to have your child there. On the back of that handout, you'll also see another QR code for volunteers. We um, need and would love your support, whether that's even just craft prep before the week or if you're actually able to be present that week helping with the kids, um, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, one thing specifically that I'd like to highlight, if you have any experience with any of those five categories that I mentioned that kids can sign up for, um, we would love to have you come for even a day to share um, with those kids what it means to actually use those gifts. Um, it's really a wonderful thing for children to see um, people in their community using those gifts to glorify God, whether that's through a job or a special, special interest that you have. Um, you can sign up on the volunteer um, form for that as well. So please sign up for that. Um, the second announcement I have is for campfires. Campfires happen every other Thursday. We had our first one a couple weeks ago. The next one is this Thursday. Um, it's for anyone and everyone. Bring a friend from the community. We would love to have, have you there. Um, we're going to spend time in scripture together. We're going to read stories that have to do with fire from the Bible. So we did the burning bush last week. We're going to do the fiery furnace this week. It's just going to be a great time of fellowship, um, not only by reading scripture together, but afterwards we'll make s'mores, spend time outside. Again, it's at the Youth House Bonfire Pit over here on our property, and it's from 6.30 to 8 Thursday night. We would love to see you there. Today, the junior highs will be leaving for their mission trip to Harrisburg. Uh, we commissioned them earlier this morning at the 8.30 service so that they could pack up and be prepared to get on the road. But please keep them in your prayers uh, this week. There are seven youth and two adults. Also today, we have the privilege of welcome, welcoming Daniel, Jacinia, and Jeruel Bain. Um, our mission partners from Nicaragua, so I'd like to invite them up and share a little bit. Well, good morning. Um, it's great to be with you this morning. Yes, my name is Daniel. This is Jasenia and our daughter Jeruel. Um, and so I know some of your faces are familiar. We were able to be here for a sabbatical in 2018 to 19 and live in the house right down the road here um, where Stephanie and John, I think, is his name, um, they, so they're living right now. Um, so yes, I'm going to let them sit down and I'll give you a little ministry update. Um, and then we're going to have to leave right after this. We've got a family gathering. Um, but it's always a pleasure to be with you here at, at Elf and Wild. Um, we were so blessed during our sabbatical to be here. 
and uh, even today and this morning and was able to share at one of the adult uh, s- classes and you, you guys just bless us. Your, your hearts are, are pure and um, make us feel welcome. Um, so thank you. So just quickly, like I, I grew up in the area and then um, went to high school uh, at Hampton College at the University of Southern California. And then right after I graduated, I moved to Nicaragua in 2005. Um, just saying I got married in 2010 and Jerrell came along in 2016. Um, and what, we, what we've been doing, we started out with a ministry um, working with uh, one of the really poor neighborhoods in Managua. Um, so there's a neighborhood near the trash dump community. Um, and so people would literally go from their houses and just walk across the street essentially into the trash dump where the fresh trash was being you know, dumped out of the trucks and find whatever they could recycle or sell or use from the trash. And so that's how they were making their living um, is just digging through the trash. And so we initially just like spent time investing in the community there and building relationships and coming alongside families and individuals, whether to pray or support them in some way um, without any real program. And then in 2010, we started a children's home for like children from that community that we you know, knew their family, had, had built relationships with them. Um, and they're all children from, you know, they're at-risk community. So whether within their own house or just within the neighborhood around them, there's all sorts of abuse, um, be it verbal or physical or sexual or um, psychological or spiritual. Um, and so we started this home, had children kind of come out of their homes and stay with us, um, and did that for 12 years. Um, and we, while they were with us, we would you know, pay for them to go to school, and um, really the Lord wanted them to learn their identity in Christ and learn their value as his children. Um, and then we also tried to come alongside their parents as well and help their parents find their identity in Christ and their value as his children with the goal of the Lord seeing you know, the family reunited and, and kind of have a, have a foundation upon which to stand. Um, so that's, that was the ministry that we did for like 12 years and then what we kept seeing is that as the children got older and got into their teen years they wanted to be with their families and so we hadn't had anyone like graduate high school successfully like through our program and so we changed our program and started to sponsor the children um, to continue to pay for them to go to school and we continued to tutor them we continued to spend time with them and building relationship um, but while they're living at their own homes. And so we have like, you know, a kind of a 15 passenger van with a driver that goes and picks them up every day and takes them to school and then brings them to a ministry center that we have. It's a tutoring, tutoring center. And so we tutor them there and then they send them home. And so that's kind of our daily routine uh, with the children. And so we've done that. This is now our second year. And now we're about to have our first high school graduates. So we're very excited about that. Um, and then the plan is to continue to sponsor them uh, as they go to college. So right now, I'm, I mean, there's, we have nine students that we're sponsoring in total. Um, two actually currently in college, and then seven that are in um, primary and secondary school. And then as we made our change um, from having an actual home where we were helping raise the children to sponsoring them in their own homes, um, the Lord kind of led me to start teaching at a local Christian school, but it's an international school. So the school, like where the children have gone, and been sponsored to is a Nicaraguan calendar, Nicaraguan curriculum. And then the school I started teaching at is an a American curriculum, an American calendar. Um, and so it's like a wealthy private school. So a lot of you know, the wealthy upper middle class Nicaraguan families will send their children here, um, sorry, to the school I teach. And the goal is for all of them to go to college in the U.S. Like that's what they all would like to do um, or, or in another country. And so it's been really interesting to see the difference as we have spent so many years with kind of the poorest of the poor uh, in Nicaragua and kind of seeing all their family brokenness and all that's gone on there. And you can see like the generation after generation, um, just the, you know, the curses that are being passed along, um, as the Bible tells us. And then now to see this upper middle class community and to see that there's a lot of that same brokenness and there's a lot of that same generational stuff that gets passed along but just not with people that have a lot of money um so for us i think like looking forward it's just this picture of okay lord you know here's the brokenness here and here's the brokenness there and 
and I still can't fix it, right? I can't fix it here, and maybe the poor seem like they need my help more. And I can't fix it here, and maybe the wealthy seem like they don't need my help. But, like, you're the, you're the only one that can fix it, right? I mean, Jesus is the only one that can fix the brokenness in the poorest slums and the brokenness in the wealthiest houses. Um, and so for us, I think, you know, I, I just see that lesson more and more of, like, the Lord is the Lord, and he needs to be the one to do the work, and he needs to be the one uh, to bring restoration, to bring healing, to bring redemption. And so, you know, it's obviously the same thing here. Um, and then we also were able to build a, a house last year in, in a ministry center. Um, and you guys, whether you know it or not, have helped us. So thank you. We've been partnering with you now for over 10 years. Um, and your congregation has faithfully given to us and supported us all along the way. Um, and even extra while we were building. And you guys are a blessing, um, much more than you know. Uh, I was, last night I was thinking about Elf and Wild and what it means to us. And I thought of, um, in the Old Testament, it tells us about the tabernacle and how in the tabernacle there was, you know, the outer court and the inner court and the Holy of Holies. And in the inner court, there was always this incense burning, right? That the priests, is one of their jobs, they had to keep this thing burning all the time, every day, all year long. Um, and how, you know, the sense of it, like I would imagine as they walked, as soon as they walked in, they just would smell it and they would sense it and they would know that they were near the presence of God. Um, and that is how we feel, my wife included, how we feel about your community here. Like it just, being here, being with you, when we think of you, it just, we feel the presence of God. So thank you for your support and thank you for your encouragement and thank you for opening up to us and loving us very well. So we appreciate it. The Baines are heading back to Nicaragua this week, and so I just wanted to offer a prayer of sending for them, and just so glad that they could join us this morning. So let's pray. Lord, you truly are the Lord of all, of overall. Um, we worship you here in this place today in Elfenwild. You are the God in Nicaragua as well. And uh, just thank you for that unity in faith and in Christ that we share. I thank you for their time of respite and seeing family um, that they've experienced here in Pittsburgh. I praise you for the bond that we have had with um, them for many years financially and, and just to support them in their sabbatical. We thank you for relationships that you've built um, among us all. I thank you, Father, for how you have called them uh, to this ministry to families and children in Nicaragua, and they're faithful to that call, Father. So now I, I lift them up to you as they will travel back home. I give them, um, pray for their safe journey. I pray that they feel renewed and strengthened in their, uh, what faces them, um, even in the difficulties. Lord, we know that you work through that as well. Bless the children and families that they minister. And I particularly pay, pray for peace in their household, Lord. Bless them and keep them. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Friends, it is good to be together in worship. Let's take a brief moment to stand and greet one another in the name of Christ.
Let us join together in our call to worship. I will exalt you, my God the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. We tell of your mighty acts. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Let us stand and sing together. Let us pray together. Lord of all creation, we gather this morning in worship of you and of you alone. God, we join together in praise because you are good. You are worthy and sufficient in every way. Again and again, you show us great mercy, finding each of us in our broken places and yet caring for us as your children. It is for your care, your mercy, and your love through the gift of your Son that we bow before you and sing praises to your name today. Lord, we ask that you would hear our praise. Be present here as we seek to magnify the truth and love that you have so faithfully shown us and called us to share. Receive our words and our songs of praise as we seek to acknowledge, love, and adore you. Our prayer today is that you alone would be seated on the throne of our hearts and may no other name be lifted higher than yours this morning. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray this. 
Amen. You may be seated. Any of the children who are here, they can come on up to the front. Have a seat. Let's turn our listening ears on. So, I want to talk to you guys a little bit of today about what it means to be belong to something or be a part of something or be in something. For example, you might be in a school or a part of a sports team or a part of a club, maybe, or maybe a country. We celebrated a certain holiday this past week. Did anyone remember what we did? The 4th of July. Good. So I was thinking on the 4th of July, and I was curious about what it takes to become a part of the United States, what it takes to be um, a citizen. So I looked it up. Now, the, my friends who were here the first service, you already know these. So if you are born into a family where both of your parents are from the United States, you are a part of the United States, you're a citizen, or you can be a citizen if you take a test. All right, so I looked up some questions for this test, and I want to see if you can answer them. Again, my first service, no given hints. All right. So one of the questions was, who was the first president of the United States? Yeah? George Washington, great. So that was an easy one, good. The second one might be a little harder. For how many years do we elect the U.S. senator? You know? Six. Six, you know it. Good job, Lucy. Way to bring that. So, you knew it too? Good job. All right, so, so, yes, Harley? Two. Two years, maybe. So, moral of the story is that that test can be hard. Some of those questions are really difficult. I didn't know all of them. I want to talk today to you guys about being a part of something else. You guys are a part of another place, and it's not a country. It's a kingdom. You guys are part of the kingdom of God. God's kingdom. Yeah. And the cool part about the kingdom of God is you don't get in by taking a test. You don't have to take a test to get in. You also don't get in if both of your parents are in the kingdom of God. It's just you and your heart. And the best part is that Jesus did all the work for us to get into the kingdom of God. He did what we would have had to do to get into the kingdom of God. He died for our sins so that we could be in that kingdom. And all it takes to be in that kingdom is we need to believe in the king, Jesus, and we need to believe that he is Lord and that he died for our sins and that he did what we needed to do to get into that kingdom. I'm going to read a verse that talks about this, and it comes from Romans which is in the New Testament, towards the end of the Bible. And it comes, so it's Romans 10, verse 9. And it says, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved, meaning you're in the kingdom. I'm going to read it one more time. I want you to turn your listening ears on. All right, here we go. It says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So because of Jesus and because of what he did, if you believe in him, you are a part of that kingdom of God. So we're a part of many different things, right? You're a part of a sports team or school or family, right? You're a part of this church. And all of those are really good things and really fun things. But the most important place you're a part of is the kingdom of God. Heaven, which is the kingdom of God. Good. Heaven, right? And the kingdom of God is a place that you can bring with you into all of those other places. You can bring the fact that you're in the kingdom of God to school, into sports, into your clubs, into your family. And I encourage you guys to share that you're in the kingdom of God with the people in those places. Invite them to believe in Jesus. Yeah, you can invite them to your house, too, to then tell them about Jesus. All of those things, yeah. 
All right, so let's pray. Let's fold our hands, close our eyes. Let's talk to God. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for being our king. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for saving us so that we can be a part of your kingdom. God, I ask that you would help us remember that we are in your kingdom and all those other places that we're at in our world. Lord, I ask that we would be able to share your love with those around us in those places and that we would never forget who we are, that we are your children and that we are in your kingdom and that you love us. And that is why you died for us so that we could be in your kingdom. I ask that you be with us today. Help us to go and be your lights um, in this world and bring your kingdom to those around us. It's in your name I pray. Amen. be seated. Our call to confession this morning is from Ephesians chapter 4. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Let's join in the unison prayer of confession. God, we confess that we are weak people, lacking self-control. We say things that we don't mean. We break promises and let our emotions dictate how we treat the people around us. Forgive us, God, and help us ask those we've wronged for forgiveness. Help us to remain in you so that we bear good fruit and others will turn to you in faith. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. You who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Please be seated. As we prepare our offerings, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we praise you this morning for your grace and mercy toward us. In all that we have received, Lord, we recognize that it has been a gift from you. In times of struggle, may we still praise you and trust in your faithfulness. And in times of abundance, may we humbly acknowledge your grace. May the portions that we give back today be honoring to you, bringing glory to your name and strength to your kingdom. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.
Friends, let us join together in one voice, affirming our faith using Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Please be seated. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we lift your name high this morning for another day and another opportunity to gather together as the body of Christ and bring worship to you. We give thanks for the ways that you have so clearly worked in our lives, but also, Lord, for the ways that you have shown mercy that has gone unrecognized. Even when we have taken your grace for granted, you have remained faithful, slow to anger and quick to forgive us. We praise you for your patience, Lord, in willingly hearing our prayers and concerns as we look to you for your blessings. And as we enter a new week, Father, we pray that you would be with the people of our congregation watching over them and caring for them in all their separate needs. We think, Lord, of the junior high mission team leaving later today. Be with them as they travel to Harrisburg and give each of them strength as they labor this week for the glory of your name and your kingdom. Be with Becca, Brielle, Lydia, Emma, Cameron, Anderson, Colin, and Stephen John. Give them servant hearts, willing and ready to bring honor to you in every opportunity that you give them. Lord, we also thank you for the faithfulness of the Bain family and their ministry in Nicaragua. We pray that you would not only work in their lives and strengthen their own family, but that you would be present with the children and the families that they minister to. May the people they reach see clearly the work of your hand as you bring glory to your name through the hands of these faithful servants. We ask also, Lord, that you would bless the summer events at Elfenwild, May those who prepare and carry out these ministries do so in faith, seeking to glorify you and bring growth to your kingdom. Lord, be also with those who are sick and weary in our church family. Bring them healing and peace as you continue to care for them in all your wisdom. We ask also, Lord, that you be with Bethany this morning as she brings us teaching from your word today. And be present with all of us here and online, preparing our hearts for your truth and for your wisdom. May we be attentive to your word and open to guidance that it gives us as we continue to face an ever-changing world. And Father God, as we continue to pray for one another, we ask also that you would hear our individual prayers and concerns. Lord God, we are grateful for your love and care, and know that you hear and acknowledge the things that lay heavy on our hearts today. In continued trust and faithfulness to you and your abundant grace, we pray as one body, using the words that Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So this morning we are going to continue working our way through Acts. We're at chapter 13, Uh, but before I read the scripture, let us pray together. 
God, as we read your word this morning, help us to listen. And may our hearts be open to hearing what you want to teach us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So our scripture is Acts chapter 13, starting at verse 13. It is a fairly long passage, so I encourage you to follow along if that is helpful to you. It's on page 1095 in your Pew Bible. Um, However, I will note that I will be reading from the NIV, so it'll be a little bit different than what you have uh, there in the pews. Hear the word of God from Acts 13. From Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. From Perga, they went on to Pisidian Antioch. On the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and sat down. After the reading of the Law and the Prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have a word of exhortation for the people, please speak. Standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, Fellow Israelites and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. The God of the people of Israel chose our ancestors. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. With mighty power, he led them out of that country. For about 40 years, he endured their conduct in the wilderness. And he overthrew seven nations in Canaan, giving their land to his people as their inheritance. All this took about 450 years. After this, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel the prophet. Then the people asked for a king, and he gave them Saul, son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled 40 years. After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. From this man's descendants, God had brought to Israel the Savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before the coming of Jesus, John preached repentance and baptism to all the people of Israel. As John was completing his work, he said, Who do you suppose I am? I am not the one you are looking for, but there is one coming after me, whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. Fellow children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and their, lead- and their rulers did not recognize Jesus, yet in condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. When they had carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he was seen by those who had traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to our people. We tell you the good news, What God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. As it is written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have become your father. God raised him from the dead so that he will never be subject to decay. As God has said, I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. So it is also stated elsewhere, you will not let your Holy One see decay. Now when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. 
Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. Take care that what the prophets have said does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, wonder and perish, for I am going to do something in your days that you would never believe, even if someone told you. As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. And when the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. They began to contradict what Paul was saying and heaped abuse on him. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, We had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region, but the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. So they shook the dust off their feet as a warning to them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Change is something that we all experience almost constantly. It begins from the moment we're born. We start to walk and talk, we go to school, we learn to ride bikes. A lot of those changes are welcome and start the beginning of new and exciting eras, like graduations, marriages, new children. But other changes are hard and unexpected, like unwanted job changes separation or divorce, losing loved ones. The changes that we encounter affect all of us in different ways, but often we desire something steady and unchanging to carry us through all of those ups and downs. And as I read this text, that is what struck me the most, that in the midst of all of our changes, Some things never change. Based on my initial reading of this part of Acts, I said to my husband, Matt, I feel like I'm just going to end up preaching the same sermon I did a couple months ago on Acts 9. And as soon as those words left my mouth, I thought, that's exactly right. The good news of Jesus that Paul preached here in this passage is the same good news that Peter preached on Pentecost. And it is the same good news that God told his people was coming all through the Old Testament. So yes, no matter where you turn, God's message of salvation through Jesus has always been the same. And that is what Paul preaches here in Acts. On this occasion, Paul and his companions visited Pisidian Antioch, which is in modern-day Turkey, or back then it was in the Roman province of Galatia. So these are the people that Paul will later write his letter Galatians to, which is in our scripture. And as was Paul's habit, he went to the Jewish synagogue on the Sabbath 
and sat down to participate in their normal service, which included prayers and readings from the law and prophets. And then their tradition was to invite an educated person from the congregation to speak about what was read. And Paul happened to fit that description. Not only was he a circumcised Jew, but a Pharisee who was educated in the law and Jewish scriptures. So when they asked if anyone had a word of encouragement for the people, Paul was ready. As Paul spoke to the Jews in the synagogue, he began with what they knew. He went through their own history of being God's chosen people, how God cared for them and led them through all of the years. And he explained how the words of all the prophets who spoke of a Savior were now fulfilled in Jesus, the one who was unjustly executed, but who God raised from the dead. And Paul preached that it is this Jesus who gives salvation. Salvation is not found through following the law of Moses with all its requirements to live perfectly and purely. Salvation won't come by making sacrifices over and over to atone for our sin. We will never satisfy God any of these ways. But instead... Jesus was the willing sacrifice who paid for our sins once for all. And he offers the forgiveness of sin who all, to all who believe in him. This message that Paul preached might have sounded new to the Jews, but really, this was God's foretold plan from thousands of years earlier that had just been fulfilled. And it remains the same message today, that salvation has come through Jesus Christ alone. Now, it's very unlikely that any of us will end up like Paul, being asked to stand up during a church service and share what we know about the scripture that is being read. But the opportunities that we do have to speak to the hearts of people are really not that different. So when those opportunities arise, do we know what to say? And this is where we can learn from Paul, starting with where people are. And we won't know that unless we listen. Paul started his time in the synagogue listening and learning alongside the people. Then he was invited to speak to what they already had heard and knew together. So as we listen to people around us, what is it that we hear? I think we will hear disappointment with children or parents or close friends questions about why things are happening in the world, and exhaustion from dealing with chronic illness or pain, or walking with other people who are experiencing these things. Earlier last week, I came across a Facebook post on a community page by someone I don't know, um, but sadly, she admitted that her family had grown apart and she was looking for help in how to parent her children. So she said she Googled positive parenting and found some things that she believed to be helpful and simply wanted to share them in case others were in the same boat. And while this is a thoughtful gesture, my heart sank as I read this because as helpful as some parenting strategies might be, they won't fix families. No self-help book or effort of our own will ever give us what we need to fix our families or this messed up world because the root of the problem is sin. 
We are all in the same place in relation to God because we are all sinners living in a broken world. And people have been in this same place since the beginning of time, which is why the good news has never changed. But the difference is, if we know Jesus, we have a message of hope. And that is what makes us different from the rest of the world. We know the answer to all of the brokenness is in Jesus. He removed our sin from us when he died on the cross. And Jesus promises to return one day to make all things right. And the trouble is that this is not the form of salvation people are looking for. Instead, people want immediate relief from everything hurtful and bad in the world. And when Google offers suggestions, and we can always try something new to temporarily fix our problems, the thought of needing a savior to take care of the root of the problem doesn't seem necessary. So it can be risky for us to say that we know the one person who has fixed it all, but that trusting in him won't necessarily make life easier on this earth. And similarly, salvation through Jesus was a risky message for Paul to be preaching in a Jewish synagogue. Because although their scriptures pointed to the coming of a Messiah who would save them, Jesus wasn't the type that they expected, or maybe that they even wanted. He wasn't a strong military leader whose goal was to overthrow the Roman government. He was God in the flesh, who loved not just the deserving in the eyes of the world, but all men, women, children, Jews, and Gentiles. And he died. According to the Jews, anyone who hung on a tree or a cross was cursed and couldn't possibly be the one to save them. And yet, Paul preached that Jesus was raised from the dead. He was different from all of the godly men like David who came before, because even David, a man after God's heart, died and was buried with his ancestors. His body decayed. But Jesus was resurrected and will never be subject to decay. And Paul repeats this part over and over because it separates Jesus out from the rest. He's not just a man. He is God who overcame death and lives forever so that we can know the forgiveness of sin and life. None of us is good enough or deserving of forgiveness. And God is so perfect and holy that he didn't have to do anything to repair our relationship. He doesn't need us. And yet, he sent Jesus for you and for me. And Paul challenges the people to believe this. And here in Acts, when Paul preaches about Jesus, there are two responses. First, there is a group who responds very positively. They are curious and want to hear more. They're engaged with Paul and Barnabas, asking questions and being encouraged by their words. The hunger for more grew so much that by the next week, verse 44 says, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. Notice also here that they heard and responded to the word of the Lord, not Paul's words. What they were hearing was from God, and they could either accept it or reject it. And this first group was eager to learn. 
But the second group, the Jews who saw the crowds and became jealous, began to contradict Paul and heap abuse on him. Their selfish desires for attention and likely their incomplete understanding of already being God's people gave them enough reason to reject what Paul taught, even though it was the word of God. So Paul boldly answered them, Since the Jews were God's chosen people who the Old Testament promises were originally given to, Paul preached to them first. But since they rejected it, the Old Testament also says that Jesus was given as a light for the Gentiles so that salvation could be known to the ends of the earth. So rather than continuing to argue with the Jews, Paul and Barnabas turned their attention to others, to the Gentiles who would listen. And the Gentiles were glad that God was for them too. And all who were appointed to eternal life believed. As Paul and Barnabas were then persecuted and kicked out of the region by high-ranking Jews, they shook the dust off their feet This act is what Jesus had instructed his disciples to do in the Gospels when people were not receptive to their message. It was a warning that God would judge them. So it was not their problem or job to convert them. God would be the one to change hearts and judge in the end. And so without that burden of responsibility, Paul and Barnabas moved on to Iconium, filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. This is an important thing for us to remember as we tell others about Jesus. We are simply planting seeds and watering them. But God gives people faith and makes them grow. So the way people respond is not in our control. We are simply called to be faithful in telling people what we know is true. So if you feel like I did for a long time, like I know the story of Jesus and I know who he is, but I don't really know how to say it or articulate it to others, I want you to look back in your bulletin at what we read together as our statement of faith. This scripture from Philippians 2 is a wonderful, brief summary of who Jesus is and what he did for us. And it is well worth your memorization. It provides an outline and a starting point for what to say about Jesus when the opportunity arises. So although much has changed through the centuries, We all still remain people who cannot save ourselves. And we need Jesus. So as we live alongside other broken people every day, we can listen for opportunities to offer the hope that Jesus is Lord and he takes away our sin if we put our trust in him. And we can pray that people receive this news with joy. Let us pray. God, we thank you that you hold us all in your hands. We thank you that you have given us a message of hope for the world and entrusted it to us. Give us ears to listen to people around us in need, courage to talk about Jesus, and confidence that you will change hearts and make all things right in your time. Through Jesus, our Savior and Lord, we pray. Amen. I invite you now to stand and let's sing together. The words are, can be found on an insert in your bulletin. Christ. 
1 Peter 3.15 says, In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. God is sending us into the world with the good news about Jesus. He asks us to plant seeds, and water them, and God will make them grow. And may the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today, tomorrow, and forever. Amen. <laughs>